What is up, guys? Welcome to episode 19 of the Sasha T Podcast, a whatnot original. We have Lou Janu on the podcast for the very, very first time. Thank you so much, Lou, for coming on. Dude. Truly honored to be here, friend. Is it episode 19 or 20? I think it was episode 19. I really wanted yeah. it to be 20 because it would have been okay. special, but yeah, it's just 19. I was told uh, it was 20 it, when I was coming on. So I did a little double check while I was uh, trying to <laughs> get a good Wi-Fi connection because for the right. last 15 minutes, I've just been trying to figure this whole thing out. It's all right. We're getting there. This is also our first um, virtual pod. How do you feel about that? Your first ever virtual pod? For for this, like, yeah. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Well, I'm excited to, to do that with you. It's a big moment. Uh, it's a big moment. Uh, if you guys don't know, Lou um, is also a host uh, for Car Talk Pod with Tyler and Car Collector 2. Um, so if you haven't checked that out yet, don't check it out. Just watch our podcast. You could like watch it right after this one's over. <laughs> like That's fine. That's I a mean, good you, way to put you it. You could. You could. <laughs> but I don't know. All right. Let's get into it. We had national, uh, the National Sports Card Convention. Uh, this past weekend, we literally just got back. I believe you got back yesterday. I got yep. back yesterday. Um, how did you enjoy the national? What were the kind of vibes you got? What plays did you make? Throw it all down for for uh, the viewers. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think of the national as an opportunity to like see people that I don't normally see. I know we didn't actually get to like have dinner or anything like that, but it's like the one of three times this year I'll probably see you. So I was really happy about that. <laughs> sure. I got to see my boy Shia the legend himself i was pumped about that but yeah it's like it's for me it's mostly just like getting to connect with people getting to see people who i don't normally get to see seeing people listen to the pod now is like a cool thing that happens um and then also it's kind of like i've described it as disney world for sports cards and cards in general so it's just fun for me to walk around and look at all the cool stuff and see all the cool pictures and the memorabilia and of course the cards so um for me that's like the biggest piece of it so did, you didn't really have like a, in terms of like you as a dealer setting up, you didn't really have like a game plan of like what you were looking to, you know, buy and sell and trade. I mean, obviously like I, I want to sell stuff while I'm there. I like to have cash on hand so I can buy things as they come available. Like, you know, an Elijah Moore prism one oh one became available to me that I was only able, I only had the cash to buy it with, you know, the actual cash on hand to buy it with because of deals down there. So I was excited about that. Um, but I don't really like to go into shows with too much of a plan in terms of like things I want to buy and things I want to sell. Obviously, I know like my cards that I want to sell, but I don't have like specific plans necessarily in place. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing as a dealer, but um, I like to keep my options open as much as possible because I never know. You never know what's going to come across the table, you know? Yeah, it was funny because I, I sent you that Elijah Moore last night. It was like the NT yeah. 101. And I don't know like what the price difference was between the NT and like the black 101. But it was it was weird how like two probably like top three or four Elijah Moore cards came up in the last like three or four days. That that is interesting. Yeah, super super wild. I I we talk about that a lot on our show, and I think about it a lot all the time too. There's just so much more product being opened now at such a faster pace, so everything's gonna come out a lot faster. Um, I was. It's a little bit upsetting for me as a person trying to collect Elijah Moore because I don't have unlimited funds. So yeah. um, kind of got to make some decisions. But it's cool to see it all out and you kind of just make a decision, right? Like, I'd rather have the option. Yeah. What did you think about the corporate setup at the National? It seemed like they had, like, a bigger – in general, like, the, the area the that they had was, was bigger, yeah. Yeah, was much bigger than last year's. How did you feel about that? What were kind of the vibes you got? Um, For me, it doesn't – affect too much for me personally i guess i can see where it's upsetting for people because they want more room for more tables for more cards but i just think as we've been talking about with everything in cross cards as this thing continues to grow and it gets more formalized and more businesses pop up and more businesses are raising money so they have more money to spend on big activations at the national um there's going to be more corporate space there's going to be more next year too so there's no way around any of that um for me, I would prefer that the activations that are there just be better, right? Like, it, or not better than they were this year or anything like that. Just like make them as good as possible because I think, in the way that it's a Disney World type of event, having things there that are fun to do, uh, I think is better for everyone. Like, I thought Zero Cool had a phenomenal setup. I really I they did. crushed like, it. Yeah, the they Stranger Things, it. 
all that. It was really engaging, and like you saw it from pretty much everywhere in the show. Whatnot as well also had a great setup with their boardwalk. So they, they, crushed for that. they crushed it. They crushed it for sure. Um, so yeah, so like stuff like that is cool, right? I, I think it should just be a fun experience for everyone. Do we lose some tables where some cards are being sold? Sure, but there's more things that come out of it, and it's not all just about the tables for people to sell, you know, their cards. No, I, I agree. I thought the corporate setup was like really fun to walk through and just like enjoy. And also like, you know, these companies, like you see them most or you see them online most of the year, but you know, these are one of the, your opportunities maybe to, if you have questions for one of these major companies to go up and ask. And um, I know I had some cool interactions with some of these startups and um, it was fun to just kind of be face to face versus, you know, people talking online or on Instagram um, about them. Yeah, I think it's just, it's always better when you're in person, right? So I'm just happy. That's like, again, back to what I was saying before, it's just one of the best parts of the whole thing. It's just everyone's all together and everyone can hang out and talk and that's how things get better. Something we talked about on the show was like, you know, cards tends to get pretty negative when everyone's too far apart for too long and bringing everybody back together kind of brings the good vibes, positive energy. So big fan. Yeah, it was, it was kind of like, um, it was good to see like, you know, on Instagram, you see like a lot of negativity, especially over the last couple of months. And it was cool to see kind of everybody get together and have a positive interaction and, and, and card show. Yeah. Um, I've given more hugs in the last seven days than I did in the prior six months. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> no, I feel, I feel, I will say the one downside was it being in Atlantic city. Cause after being there for a full week, I would I have no reason to go back there ever again. Listen, I'm a New Jersey guy through and through. You'll never catch me on wax talking bad about New Jersey. So there can be some improvements for sure. This is a trash area, bro. It's so it's, bad. It, like, Atlantic City is for upset. a card it, show. You have inventory on you and you're walking around the street. I heard like a guy got mugged and like beaten up. And Yeah. Uh, all kidding aside, like the show is changing. The attendees of the show are changing. So I think people need to be conscious of that and the places they're bringing the show to in the future. Like there's got to be something done. People got to stay. And obviously on a certain level, people have to stay safe and know where they are and act accordingly. Regardless of where you, yeah, yeah. Totally. But like it, there was definitely some, I was uncomfortable down there a couple of times, like just to be very honest, like that's real. So I, I agree with you. I had a, this is like so off topic, but one time we took a cab at night and the dude hosed us. We had five people in there or four people in there. And he goes, I didn't see that he didn't have the meter on. I didn't notice it. Yeah. And then we got dropped off. He's like $8 a person. And I was like, and this was like a, maybe an eight, $10 ride. Yeah, I, I I couldn't believe it, and then we were we were just like, what? What the? Like, it was not fun. Yeah, I'm in in those situations. Shout out to all my cab drivers. I'm an Uber person through and through for that exact purpose. It's very transparent. This is how much you're paying. It might be a little bit extra because there's surge, whatever. I don't care. I don't want to deal with that stuff. That's just me though. Yeah, that was like the only reason we took the taxi is the Uber would have taken too long, but. Yeah. Usually, like, the taxi ride to the show is, like, $12, and I always give the person a 20 Right. Yeah, I did the same yeah, thing all week a, long. Yeah, like, have a good day, whatever. This guy hosed us. Yeah. It was worse than, like, some of the prices at the car shows being 20%, 30% over comps. <laughs> yeah, that's that's unfortunate. There's a, Yeah, there was a few things that are just not great, but hopefully in the future it'll be better. You think they'll bring uh, the National ever to California back to Anaheim again? I hope so. I hope so. I, I think I think the national should expand beyond the original three series. I've thought that for the original three series uh, cities, but that's just my perspective. It's uh, it's Chicago, oh, Cleveland. Yep. And then and Atlantic City. Yeah, those are the three main uh, locations. As far I as think I Chicago's. Know. I think Chicago is solid. I've never been to Cleveland, but I think I, I don't. I think that would be cool too. Cleveland's a fun city. I happen to like Cleveland as a city, so it'd be dope. Chicago is also really good because of how it's set up with the hotels and everything. Did you get your hotel yeah. yet, by the way? No. I locked in my hotels already. Is it sold out or something already? I don't know, but I got ahead of it because I wasn't going to miss it. 
What are these? What are the vibes of the prices right now? GQ? The vibes are kind of good, to be honest. I got some good prices on my room. Did you get so. your uh, airplane ticket too? No. Okay. Chicago to New York. There's enough flights every day. I'll figure it out later. But hotels, that's a a diminishing asset for sure. Are you guys gonna have the whole crew like to, to Chicago? Or... <laughs> yep, the whole crew will be there. Um, Was it? Yeah. Go no, ahead. go ahead. No, there's a lot of good things planned. I'm excited about it. Next year is gonna be really, really good for us. Was it tough, like, to see, like, because I saw, um, like, Gary, like, a couple times, like, a shit ton of people around him kind of felt, like, bad in a way because it seemed like he kind of just wanted a deal. Like, was it – what are the vibes on that? It's all good vibes. People come, they want to say, hey, that's fine. Saying people want to come up to you and yeah, talk yeah. to you. You know what I mean? It's the same thing. It's just on a bigger scale because he's a bigger personality, obviously, right? So – he like lo- from what I as far as I could tell, he loves that stuff. You know, it's all hanging out, it's all good times, right? Yeah. Um, and he definitely did his fair sale, fair share of buying and selling. So, I think it was all good vibes all the way around. For sure. Yeah, I just feel like it's like tough, like sometimes in like that environment of like having like a bunch of people around you, and like you just wanting to like do like one thing. But yeah, totally. But kind of part of the deal, right? That's one of the parts of being him. Is what it is, right? Yeah. Um, are you excited for any other like shows coming up? Or you kind of show like your show scenes kind of done for a while? You know how I am. I don't love to travel to anything, but um, you should come to the Burbank show. I would. I I would love to come to the Burbank show. There's a lot of other things that have to happen in order for me to get to the Burbank show. Um, but I I think we'll probably I, I think I'll probably be at one or two more shows before the end of the year whether that's local maybe. or traveling somewhere maybe a certain city in the south middle of the country maybe we'll see or burbank i would love Dallas. to come to burbank i would love burbank to come. be a really good show the reason i'm bringing it up is because like from what i'm like from what i know it's going to be like solid yeah i mean I there's, like a, there, there's not like huge shows i mean there are they're like over here there's like a a lot of small shows during the week. Um, and then we have like, two big shows out here. One of them, which is going to be the first show, Burbank. And then uh, there's also one in San Diego, uh, Union Marketplace. I've never um, been to San Diego before, and I would love to go. So like, that's the kind of thing I can get excited about. If I can just go to San Diego for the weekend, then also go to a card show. That's interesting. Yeah, that's October, I believe. But now here's the other problem. In the fall, it's football season. So like, I'm all Jets all the time. And that kind of blocks out my Sunday. Yeah, you can figure it out. Maybe. Probably. You think not, Zach though. you think Zach Wilson's gonna be good? I do. I believe in Zach. I truly believe in Zach. All kidding aside, mo- setting aside like the Jets fan part, I think the offensive coordinator and the situation they're putting him in limits his downside. The question is how big is his upside? And that's the difference between becoming Kirk Cousins or becoming Joe Burrow. And that's kind of how my brain is operating right now. But the, the Jets were pretty trash last year, right? Pretty trash last year, for sure. So comeback season then? Comeback season, they had a really strong draft. They're actually building something. It takes a little bit of time for that stuff to start. I don't expect them to be a playoff team this year, but seven wins will be a lot more than the four they had last year, and then you know, hope to keep growing from there. Well, because the reason I'm bringing it up, like Zach Wilson prices at the show and like over the last couple of weeks has been like it's pretty strong. Like his yeah, he's gotten expensive really well. Yeah, his, I mean, football in general has gotten expensive, but in context, he's expensive. Like compared to yeah, Trey, I used to think Trey was too expensive. I'm now going the other way. Well, Trey stuff has literally died, which is confusing to me because in real life, he just finally got named the starter. And because Luca, it's because Luca prices died, and Trey's off of Luca. All moderns off of Luca. I'm talking about much. Trey. I'm talking about Trey Lance from the 49ers. Oh, I thought you were talking about Trey Young. Trey Lance stuff has gone up. I know, but I feel like it hasn't gone up at the same rate that Zach stuff went up, and that's why my brain switched. Mm. But maybe you you would know better than me for sure. I bought a cam. I bought a camo at a twenty five raw for two thousand, graded at PSA ten, and I moved it Must for be like nice sixty. To be you. Well, I, I have a lot of grading L's as well. <laughs> yeah, I know, but that's but, just a big, but, that's a big W. But for um, me. moved it for sixty five hundred trade pretty easily at the show. And a lot of other Trey Lance is moving well. I would say the one guy that is like really, really hot right now, like like selling like liquid like water was um 
uh, Jalen Hurts. That's not surprising. He's like the every, he's everyone's favorite underrated guy, which means he's yeah, not he's, underrated at all. But his price and his price points are super cheap compared to even Zach Wilson. I think Zach his Wilson, price his price points are that low for a reason, though. I guess you know. It, it's funny because like there's it's like a there's a guy like let's say Kyler Murray, who his price points have gone down a lot, but nobody's touching him. But he's not like an undervalued guy in a way. He's like nobody wants him type guy. Versus yeah. Jalen Hurts, like you mentioned, it's everybody's like sleeper pick. Right, but if Jalen Hurts has one more year like he had last year, he'll go into the coward territory where no one will, will care anymore. Like Sam Darnold. Yeah. That's my guy, though. I'm trying out 14. <laughs> I, uh, I was looking on eBay last night, and I saw this, like, nasty patch out of 99. Sam Darn, like, nasty patch. was, like, at, like, 400 bucks with, like, a minute to go. Was it a Jets one? Yeah, yeah, It was his main rookie and TL99. Oh, I think maybe I should start collecting, like, all my failed Jets, like, all the people that I really loved, and just buy all of their really good stuff. Well, because if you think about it, their prices are so cheap, so it's, like... Right. And it's you just have massive me, upside. Yeah. yeah, you have massive upside. And also, if nothing ever happens, you still like the cards. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna <laughs> I'm actually gonna look into that. That'll be funny for me. You have nothing to lose whatsoever. Nothing. It's a really good idea. I'm really gonna I actually might attack that tonight. It's interesting how different people PC stuff. Yeah. Like it's funny how like like I, I'll get like things on Instagram, it's like Oh, like you're like a dealer, like you're a flipper, like you're not holding that card that you just got in. I'm like, no, like there's no way. Like I, I have no reason to hold this ten or ten thousand dollar card. Like I, I don't even like the guy that much. I'm just doing it because, like, it's like a business, like it's like a job, right? And then people were like, well, what do you PC? And I and I'm like, I like weird shit, like, like uh sticker stickers from like the sixties and seventies of like Muhammad Ali and stuff like that. Like that's my jam, and it's like super cheap, and I like it, and I can buy a bunch of it. Yeah, like that's I, the stuff I like. Yeah, I think this has been an ongoing conversation in cards for the last few years. And it's like, if you have a problem with the way someone operates in cards, that's on you is kind of where I'm at. There's certain things I don't like too, but it's just like, it is what it is. What am I going to do? Like try to inflict my opinion on everything. Like that's just not how the world works. So if you have, I used to be the type of person who didn't have a PC, everything was for sale at all times. I kind of can't see a situation where I would sell this Elijah Moore one of one. So I, I guess I'm changing in that way, but not everything is for everybody all the time. So you're going to do things your way. I'm going to do things my way. Someone else to do the things their way that mean you yeah, don't yeah. like, and that's just how it is. But there's also like a beautiful part about it, like a PC. It's like, you're saying like, Oh, you never sell your Elijah Moore one one but let's say like for some reason, like another, you know, pretty sick Elijah Moore card come, would come up, which would have to be either that NT 101 that, like, let's say hypothetically somebody has that NT 101, you can use your black 101 in trade to, like, at, yeah. like, get it somehow. Like, that's a beautiful part about a PC, too, is, like, your PC can always be evolving, mm -hmm. just like how, like, a dealer's, you know, set up at a card show, every show to show evolves in the same way. Exactly right. Just like how a card shop their inventory moves. It's if funny you think about it like a card shop. It's very, it's very funny the way people op, like react to someone like you. If you compare it to a card shop, it's the same thing. The exact same thing. It's literally the exact same thing. I had never thought about it that way, but that's very true. And that's why it's weird how like uh, uh, I wouldn't say like the community, but like people like to to have segments for putting slots of people in. This person's this thing, flipper or dealer. This person is. You know, this thing where it's like, no, like, we're kind of all doing the same thing. It's just in a different way or a different name. Yeah. Everybody's doing the same thing all the time. Anyone who says they don't sell cards for money, if they're truly, if they've truly never sold a card for a dollar of profit, good for you. The, That's amazing. Everyone else is lying. It is just a matter of degrees. The worst thing ever is when I like see something on Instagram and they make like a two paragraphs about like, oh my God, I just picked up my grail card. Like two whole paragraphs about this card. Then I see like a week later, sold. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like sometimes people have to like pretend that's become a big thing. 
You know what I mean? Oh, like they yeah. like screw like, that. You know, this is a big PC card for me, and then it's gone the next week. Again, I have no opinion. Do what you want to do. Have a blast. <laughs> it makes it has so no impact on me whatsoever. Me. I've let go of all that stuff. But it is kind of crazy when someone's like, "This is my biggest card of all time," and then they just sell it for cash and get something completely different. But they're a collector. Good for you. No opinion. That's my perspective. My perspective is no perspective. Uh, Shia had a good time seeing you these last couple of days too. Dude, Shia is an interesting kid. I had no idea <laughs> all about the life of Shia. And um, I love that. This is no kidding aside. I haven't even said this. I haven't said this to him. So it's going to be funny if he hears this in real time. He was dressed extremely well for being at a card show. And I respect that a lot. <laughs> he takes... 45 minutes to get ready every day. That's fire. I respect that, Shai. Don't let Sasha tell you you can't do that. No, I, I respect it too. It's just, it's, you know, he gets the blow dryer out. and <laughs> he, he was gelled the... up. He had the nice shirt on, the good pants. I loved it. He's ready. He's ready for action. Yeah, but he's, a, he's an interesting kid. And he's the kind of person that I really like watching operate in cards because um, much like you, you guys are very, very smart and much smarter than me. And I think Shia has an interesting perspective on how things should work and how he operates in the market. So I like watching him. He's very selective in, in how he gets stuff done, for sure. He's extremely selective. Yeah. We made a couple good plays, though, that we like. Uh, we went in like together just for fun to see if we can flip him at the show. And it was kind of fun to uh, to do that again just because he's in, he's in college and you know he's not really at the shows too much uh, yeah. these days locally. Do you want to talk about how you tried to pull a fast one on me together or no? What did I do? With Zach Wilson? Zach Wilson. The contenders? Um, I think I moved that card, didn't I? I know you did. I'm saying you tried to pull a fast one on me. No, I didn't. <laughs> That's not true. You actually thought like... You actually no, I didn't, I didn't. Pulled up a, you pulled up a comp that wasn't even like the card and you, you thought for a second I was... I did Remember think for that? a second you were. Yeah, it was the rookie ticket versus like a championship ticket or something like yeah, that. Is that what I was like doing? That. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was. And then I literally showed you the comp. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just didn't have the cash. I actually probably would have bought that card. I need to get a, I, a nice sack to, to have. I got a black Pandora from Cage, actually. Oh. Uh-huh. So I did a deal with Cage. Okay. He came by the table. Um, and he, he took one of my vintage cards. Uh, I got to check what it was. Um, I think it was a Wilt. And uh, he actually, I guess, ripped that card raw. And we were trying to figure out the deal. And he's like, oh, I have this Zach Wilson in grading right now. I'll go pick it up. And then it came back like a 9.5. And it like made the deal work perfectly. There you go. So I was like the piece that we were missing. That's awesome. I love that. I love it when a plane comes together at the National. Yeah, because a lot of times, more times than not, it doesn't. There's a lot of almost deals that happen at the national. I'll say that it's a heavy, like really think about it, get really close to the finish line and then pull away kind of show. The whole Wi-Fi thing was interesting too. Cause I just bought the Wi-Fi and I was crushing. Yeah. So I didn't know that you could just purchase Wi-Fi. I wasn't, no one told me about that, including you. So that's interesting. But I think next year, oh, I, I, didn't know have, you had, I didn't know you had an issue with the Wi-Fi. Like, I didn't, what do you mean? I'm a person at the show. Of course I have issues with the wi-fi i thought you had it figured out i mean you're at the you know you're at the the big table over there no i did not have corporate wi-fi next year i will figure out the wi-fi situation because i cannot go hours with no phone anymore that, that's just and, not a world i can live in yeah and, this, and it, it helped a lot because so many dealers didn't have it and i don't i guess maybe they didn't know that there was like you did because i was just like why won't somebody pay 80 dollars for wi-fi like literally 10 percent of the room probably had wi-fi and the people that had cards would end up presumably going to those tables because they would, you know, go off of off of comps. But there was like a day there though that I didn't know that, and I was just kind of I wouldn't say guessing, but like guessing like on stuff, and like I kind of knew some of the comps from beforehand in in my head, and um, that was cool too because people like that because you can get through with them quickly and. Um, and it was basically like, can you operate without data in a way? Yeah, I the first day struggled with that because I was like attaching myself to prices. You know what I mean? And I think the second day I came back around and I made it like my first couple deals of the day, I kind of gave myself, I kind of gave up and just gave myself a little bit more room of 
you know, people want to make a deal kind of thing. And it helped so much. So I think having the data is good and just being able to make a fast deal. People who are willing to make fast deals just make everything so much easier. Or do dice rolls at the end of the deals? I love a dice roll at the end of a deal. That's That might be my new thing with everyone. All my deals at the end, except for Cage, because he didn't want to do it, were dice rolls at the end. It's kind of fire. It's so fun. I think a dice roll for like an extra 5% on either end is a fun game to play. 100%. That's what it was like. We were doing like $100 dice rolls like when we were off. And then like at the end. Hypothetically, that's just for fun. What do you mean? A dice roll is just for fun. We're just having fun. Yeah. It, it, it is for fun. Yeah. But then at the end, because I was doing it with like the same guy. The the price point separated a lot. Like we the biggest roll was like either I paid him like two or eight hundred, like in mm. the deal, like added value. Mm. That was yeah. not a smart decision, but that's not great. That's a lot. But just a little bit yeah. for fun is fun. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I remember the last day me and um Mark Ultimate Pastime, which I think you met. Yes. Um in the room, because like we don't really gamble, we were doing like five dollar dice rolls, like in the room. But why can't you just uh, go downstairs and play five dollar, like games of roulette? I didn't think about it like that. But what about blackjack? How do I get you at a blackjack table for like two to three hours? I don't know, but it was interesting. It was interesting to see how many card people do like to gamble. Like, I mean, like, that's I, not surprising I, I like to you, to, is it? I guess not. Like I like to do like dice rolls and stuff at the end of deals just because I don't want to deal with like how much we're off. Like just if it's fair, we'll roll it and like whatever. Like that's cool with me. Mm-hmm. But like the whole like more like hardcore gambling stuff like at the casinos, like responsibly. It was pretty hardcore, like the amount of money that people were putting out at the casino. I can't speak for anyone else. I know for myself, I'm a responsible gambler and I love to responsibly play some blackjack for an extended period of time. As long the way you have to think about it is like if you think of it as, you know, you're putting a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, whatever you're comfortable with, and you think of it as, all right, I sit here for two hours and when I walk away, it was just for fun. If I lose everything, that's great. Breaking even is like my goal at the casino, you know? Losing large amounts of cash is not a fun time and I don't participate in that. But having like some fun money, that's what it's good for. Do you think like the whole like having a card show at a casino is like a vibe or like is that something that I think the interests are aligned, that's for sure. I think the interests are aligned. Yeah. Um the question Just is Just a casino is like a weird place to have like a, a trade night. Like that's like it kind of takes like the youth the focus. I feel like. Yeah, maybe the focus or like slash youth. That's right? for or sure. No? I mean, it definitely takes the youth out of it. They can't be in there if they're under 21, right? So that's going to hurt a large segment of people who go to trade nights. Yeah, I guess. Because there's like a lot of shows happening in Vegas and that's either, you know, maybe it's cheaper to get a venue out there right now because like the whole COVID stuff, like what, how COVID affected Vegas or, you know, these, um, the people that are running the show's are kind of liking the aspect of like gambling and card card show, I guess. Because breaking has gotten massive too, and that's just like breaking. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like it's 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 not surprising that the interests of a person who participates in the hobby and uh, likes to play casino games are similar. Don't you think breaking? Do you think breaking from last year to this year has gone bigger? Definitely. Way more than like more dealers coming into the industry i feel like right definitely yeah because i got that was yeah i agree with that i think there's less big cards available than there are packs open so of course there's going to be more people coming in in that and i also think breaking is the number one entry point for people in cards and it will always will be because someone's always gonna the way you're gonna hear about it is you're chasing a card or something like that and that's how you get into cards so i'm not surprised that it continues to grow at like an exponential rate there's also been a lot of energy put into building out that technology and building out that process yeah i feel like there's more money flowing into breaking certainly 
which I agree is a, I guess a positive, positive thing in a way. It's just a way in and like, listen, I know people who do breaks and nothing else. That's cool. That's what you want to do. That's fine. I guess you can well, kind of like make an argument. Like consumers that like wash. break or like they break as a business? Consumers. Okay. People that exclusively do breaks and nothing else. They don't buy singles. They don't buy boxes themselves. Nothing like that. Only breaking. I remember a couple of years ago, we talked about how like there will be, you know, places at casinos where they'll do box breaks. Do you still think that's something that will, will I happen? I do. I think there's versions of that that will happen. Like, I don't see why not. Like, what, what if, again, it's all dependent on a lot of different factors, but like if a company that owns a casino or has an interest in a casino also has an interest in cards, like, that's just a naturally aligned interest. Like it would just make sense to do, you know what I mean? But I still yeah. like we had the joke a long time ago, you and I did. And on the show too, it's like Instagram casino. You know what I mean? Like that's what it is. Yeah. It's not going to change. And the difference from then and now is like these companies, like, like whatnot, for example, has just crushed the, the, like they, they've almost taken Instagram for breaking out of the picture and made a, like a, a clean platform where transactions are complete through and through. There's no like, oh, I'm not going to send payment or anything like that. Yeah. And they kind of put, they kind of put all the sellers in one place where it just simplifies it for consumers, I guess, in a way. If they want to break with a certain breaker, they can see the time they're breaking, the day they're breaking. Mm -hmm. um, it's cool. It's, just a, it's, 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 a more, it's a more built out experience for someone in cards who wants to go on their phone and do a break from the buying, from the viewing it to the buying it to the scheduling it to the shipping of it to the whatever. All of it's just more simplified. Um, and that's been their biggest success, obviously. Yeah. It's, it's been kind of crazy to see the evolution of, of whatnot. Cause I think we I actually, it was funny because. I uh I was looking the other day and it was like my one year anniversary as a seller. Like a couple wow, of years ago. look at you. Congratulations, friend. Yeah. It was cool. It's cool to see. You. you should do like a you should do like a party. Like a birthday party. You know what I mean? I'm not a big birthday party guy. You're not? No. I'm I guess that makes yeah, sense. I don't know when your birthday is. It's in October. It's coming Interesting. up. Interesting. But yeah, I'm like a very You're um, a very mellow guy. That's not really your vibe. Yeah, I get that. Low key. Shia though, no, he's not a mellow guy. No, tell you that much. Tell you that much. That's hard to believe, based on what I know about him as a human. He likes to get actually, after it a little bit. Yeah, good. Where I just want to have a nice meal. Oh, I'm the same way. You know me. Yeah, that's why we should have got dinner, but it was, you're too busy. You're I'm not too busy. Plays. I have stuff going on when I'm there. <laughs> I'm not I mean, just like I open. I can't just like go live my life. That's not how it works. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna make my way out to uh to New York soon. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, make it happen. I'll hopefully make it happen. I think, I think you can make it happen if you want to. It's just gonna be how bad. In the same way you tell me, like, oh, come to LA, come to LA, come to LA. Some would say that I'm in the lead, one to nothing, with traveling across the country for each other in our friendship. True, but you did go under uh, a work, a work. Well, yeah, I had stuff to do, but I also found yeah. time to hang out with you. Yeah, I, I'll set it up. I was going to go for NFT NYC, and then um, I, I was going to say that NFTs just crashed, and I didn't go. But I actually, that was like the one that was like a, a vacation I had to get out to. Um, wasn't oh to right? Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, what it was. No, I know. Like, yeah, but um, NFTs did crash that week, and I felt bad for anybody who was out there. Not my thing. So uh, you made your a couple of plays with NFTs, didn't you? Yeah, I've kept it pretty simple. I just don't understand it. You know what I mean? I mean, like this is an NFT right here that I got printed out. So what NFT is that? Uh, Buddha Ben is his name. Shout out to Buddha Ben, great artist, big fan. So you're not messing with NFTs right now. I keep it very simple. I got my V friends. I got that one right there. I got one or two other things. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I just don't understand it the way I understand cards. Right. So I can't be as free with my decisions. Do you think there'll be like more interaction between like NFTs and cards for the future or not? Like in terms of like uh, technology wise. 
I think you can't ignore the technology of the thing. The way it gets implemented is a whole other part of it. Um, I think it is in the company's interest to digitize things. So I guess you can't ignore it as a possibility. The question is how much of a part of the day-to-day does it become? Like, does it become, are all cards NFTs? Probably not. Uh, but how and how much of it is NFT based, I think is the question. And then how does the community react to it? Because obviously the card community is historically not the most fond of NFTs. Yeah, I mean we've had over the, like we've had over the last like, two years like we had fractional ownership come into play, and I don't know if that's like, necessarily worked as much as we thought it would. Right? When you say that, no, what do you mean? In what way? I don't know. I just think I thought it would be more. I guess for me, I I thought from where we're at today, it would be more prevalent. I think um, it's pretty prevalent. There's a lot of fractional ownership happening. Like, how many assets like, are live on all these sites across all the sites right now? A lot, but so, see, the, I guess more. I guess the more of the problem isn't like fractional ownership as a whole. It's more of like the market. Like a lot of when a lot of these companies bought these cards, like they were buying them almost or at peak values, and now they're sure if they're trying to fill them at that value or more, they're not filling. So I guess that becomes the issue. Sure, I guess you could say that's the risk that those companies took when they put them when they brought the cards on in the same way that someone who bought whatever card at the peak of the card themselves you know same thing it's just the matter it's just a company as opposed to yeah yeah. but i guess i guess you see more of like on on social media these cards aren't filling versus like the ones that are maybe i haven't been as close to it recently i definitely think you know there's a few companies now doing that type of thing and they've all gotten pretty large in the last year and a half. Like what, collectible? Collectible, rally. Like, they're out there. It's not like they've gotten smaller in the last year, you know what I'm saying? From like an offering perspective. Yeah. I think you can't, obviously, obviously you can't ignore the, when they purchased the car and how much it was worth versus today. You can't ignore that part, obviously, but to like, from a strictly from like a user base perspective and like amount of people buying fractional ownership, that's definitely increased to get back to like the main question. I definitely can see though, over the next couple of years, you know, one or two or some of these companies going under just because of how things shake out. Like we had star star stock went under. And I remember when star stock came out, it was like people People fucked with it pretty heavily. Um, yeah, I don't. I actually don't know the situation with that, but um, of course, there's going to be winners and losers. And I think a lot of these companies are trending towards doing similar things, whether that's whoever. Um, a lot of companies are going to be doing similar things, so it's just going to be a matter of winners and losers. That's how it is with any market, with any not market, with any industry that grows. There's always going to be people doing the same things. Do you buy cards off of like auction houses or? Like, have you heard about like all in? in yeah, I mean, I mean, me and you talk about it, right? So yeah. I see them. I see them when they're out there. I've participated in auctions before. I've never personally won a card on an auction house. We got to change that. I would love to. I would love to buy something. I've participated. I just keep losing. <laughs> you know what was so funny on Golden? You know what card I saw? Remember yeah. I told you a couple weeks ago the Hamilton that we used to have as a PSA 9 sold? Mm-hmm. Um, that that same Hamilton popped up again on Golden, and it's running an auction right now. That's interesting. I don't know. I, I to be honest, I haven't done enough research into that high end stuff and like how often those cards are being flipped. When I talk to you, it sounds like it's fairly liquid. I I guess like for me, I don't understand making an investment into that card and then flipping it inside of that time period that's never made a lot of sense to me especially if you're going to take that big of a loss on it or whatever like i I don't totally get that but again teach their own yeah i don't i'm pretty sure it was the same exact card and i agree if i like let's say because i remember i was trying to buy it i was texting you i got outbid but if i bought that card I, i probably wouldn't have put it back on golden again 
Um, but maybe they bought, you know, a bigger Hamilton. They just want to liquidate that one. Yeah, they had it yeah it's just like impossible to know the full context of the situation, but that's interesting. Yeah, but it is like a lot of people talked about how a lot of dealers price points were high um, at the show. Mm-hmm. And for me, um, especially here, like where I'm at, like I go to, I would say like maybe like three or four shows a week. And um, I usually do a better time. I mean, some weeks I'm not, but buying on auction houses um, because, you know, the people that are putting up their cards on auction houses are willing to get whatever the true market value is. Whereas I feel like if you're a dealer and it's just tough because, you know, some of these cards, they're into price points where you're having a hard time letting go at current market value. Um yeah, I mean, and I it showed at the it showed at the national. That's for sure. I mean, there was a lot of people who had irrelevant pricing on their cards, um, for sure. But I don't know. I think the auction thing is. I'd be so scared to run an auction. Oh my! I can't even. You want remember. me? You want to tell? You want me to tell you a story? This is related yeah. to uh, your boy Brock as well. Is a good Rock one. is my boy. If he's watching, so, it, he is my boy. So, uh, I bought an Otani Bowman Chrome Gold PSA ten off of oh. Alt. Okay, like a month or month or two ago, because the comp before that, when I was buying it, was two weeks ago on PWCC Premier, and the comp uh-huh. was seventy two thousand dollars. Okay, and this I was really respect. Like, Can I pause you for one second? I respect your transparency on such a level you can't even describe. Keep going. I just want to. I want to be truthful, but it's also related it. to the. It's also related to the story. So, I was on all, and this card is at like twenty thousand dollars, like three minutes to go, and I was like, "Oh my god, this thing's about to like die!" Right, and uh, at that point, Otani was pretty liquid, so I was like, "Okay, like I'll go up to." I think I, my hybrid was up to like fifty-two, because I was like, "There's still enough juice on that thing to like get the value out of it," in my opinion. So wait, you did up, not own the card yet? I didn't own the card yet. I just, I did like my research. I was like, okay, it sold for 72. It was the same exact yeah. card. Like literally the same card. It's in auction. It's running. I put my max bid in at, bid in at like 53. I end up winning it for 47,000. Mm-hmm. So two weeks prior, this card sells for 72. I just win it for 47,000. I feel amazing, right? I'm like, okay, this is dope. Like I'm going to get it in. I'm going to move it within like the next like week and a half. Mm-hmm. I get it in. Can't move this card. Another week, yeah. can't move this card. Another week goes by, can't move this card. I'm like, I'm like, and, and usually with all, like a lot of stuff went so cheap that you could flip it and it's just super easy because people see the comps, but that auction and maybe the one prior, it started to change where like alt comps became the true comps in a way mm-hmm. um, where people were, you know, that became like what the card was worth. So I can't move this thing. I can't move this thing. I can't move this thing. I'm just like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And uh, and I'm like, all right, you know, I'm gonna put it on Premiere because the last comp was 72 on, and it was on Premiere. So mm-hmm. I tell Brock about it. Brock gets it in the last day. Shout out to Brock, um, the legend. And, yeah, shout out to Brock. And then uh, the All Star game happens. You know, there's a little bit of a Tani hype like during the auction. The last day comes about, which I think was like two weeks. It wasn't this past Friday. It was the Friday before. And I wake up, and this card is at like. Twenty like five thousand dollars or something like that. Twenty four thousand dollars. It's the last. Oh, so day. you're in pain. So I'm like, I'm in I'm pain. Like, All right, this is this is going to be rough, but I'm going to take it on the chin, you know, mm-hmm. like like a big boy. Right. And I hit up Brock, and I and I'm like, Yo, bro, you know, what's the word? What's going on, bro? You know, trying to get the nerves out of there. And then it goes into extended bidding at like thirty. And then I'm like, all right, I'm not even going to look at my phone because this is just going to be pure pain for the night. I get a call from Brock and he's like, yo, check this auction. Two whale, two people just start hitting it, hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. Um, and it ended up, ended up going for 63. So I wow. think I netted like, yeah, so I think, I think I netted insane. like, yeah, I think I netted like 56 or 57. Wow. The reason I said the transparency thing is, um, 
It takes a lot of balls to be very honest about how big some of these plays are that you make on a week to week basis. And um, you share your L's as much as you share your W's. And just hearing you go through it in real time there, I just wanted to give you some props and give you some 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 shine because you deserve it. Yeah, I appreciate that. I don't I don't really make big plays like that anymore. Like that was like the one like I'm still like I don't really want to make that big of a card purchase like after that unless it's vintage. Like I have way too much anxiety to buy a card that expensive. I I I would much rather buy and I do buy more cards that are under a thousand dollars than you know, over ten or over a thousand because A, there's way more buyers for it. Your buyer pool I mean there's only a, a, a small amount of people that are willing to spend, I feel like over like five thousand dollars on it on a, on a, on cardboard. I actually wanted to ask you that question. It's fun. I can't believe you just said that. You totally stole my number one question. I was going to ask you. What was the, what was like the my number one question was going to be where is the amount like on the scale right like you're looking at like a hundred dollars up until you know a hundred thousand dollars. Where is the amount where you see the biggest drop off in like buyer pool? Now, like in the current market today, yeah, I, I would say like it's interesting because I had this conversation with somebody else a couple of weeks ago, and what I was saying was it's kind of like how do I explain this? It's kind of like like think of cards as like the economy in a way, and when the you know economy goes down, most of the people that get really really crushed are in that kind of middle class area. Mm-hmm because it kind of rides the wave with the economy. And I think it's the same yeah. way about it with cards. When cards went like crazy, those cards that were like $1,000, $2,000, $10,000, let's say went to 50, 100,000 and went crazy. You know, mm-hmm. all those cards that are there are going back down right now, right? Um, so I would say like the buyer pool in the middle is getting really affected. But the ones that are hel- holding strong the most is like the super premium, premium, premium. For example, like the 9.5 mantle that's running on Heritage. The people that are buying that card are not necessarily affected by the economy today. They are not. And and then the people that are a thousand and under, that's more affordable to the person where they can make it make sense in their head to make that purchase. Because mm-hmm. the downside is way less risky than let's say a 10, 20, 30, 40 thousand dollar card. And that's what we're seeing a lot. Like with all throwing up all these, you know, cards that were fifty, sixty, seventy, a hundred thousand dollars, and now they're doing ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars on their auctions. Um, it's kind of showing where we're at with cards today. Not saying that those cards won't go back up. There's a lot of great buys out there today that are good holds, but there also is still room for a lot of these cards to go down. Definitely. Like there, I think we are not at the end of the macro global economic turmoil not to use a lot of big words in a row um we are not at the end of that by any stretch of the imagination from what i can tell as a stupid person who didn't graduate college but um you didn't graduate college nope nope i went to night school i went to night school for two semesters i have like 12 credits in total you just didn't like it i mean i was working full-time i worked at vayner from the i graduated high school on june 22nd and i started at vayner on july 12th that's like pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. I was doing a school in Vayner at the same time for a little bit. And you were just, I'm bouncing school. Yeah. I mean, I talked to my mom and my mom was the only reason I was there to begin with. And I kind of talked to my mom about it and I was like, mom, like I can't commit to either of these things. So I'm kind of just half Very into bit. both. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I'm yeah, not gonna, like just, just a fun fact. I didn't know that. Yeah. I thought I told you that. I mean, my high school GPA wasn't great either. So. So doesn't matter. Mine wasn't that good. Mine wasn't that, that good. mine was worse. Really? Yeah. You tell me yours. I'll tell you mine. I, I mean, I can give you like an S. I think mine was like a two eight five or like. A oh yeah, nine. mine was way worse than yours, brother. Really? One point seven. <laughs> oh my dog is like. Yeah, I mean that's not a secret. I've told people that before. You have a dog? Yeah, I do have a dog. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, bro, my my GPA was trash in high school. I didn't go to class. I mean, now you're working at VaynerMedia. Yeah, it all worked out in the end, I guess. And you're and you're a host of Car Talk Pod. You're, you're made it, bro. What are you talking about? <laughs> What'd you say? You said you made it, bro. What are yeah, you I made about? it. <laughs> yeah, I made it. Um, that's funny. What were we talking about before? Uh, like we were talking about all liquid options. Oh, I was gonna bring up a good point. This is the point. 
like with the whole fluctuation thing, yeah. like I have a LeBron refractive time that I'm in pain on. Like that's just, it is what it is. Like sometimes you get like caught with like the momentum of like the market. Yeah. Like it just, but I, that's, I could, I could, or, or could have sold that card a couple weeks or months ago and caught it out fine. But I wanted to run the market, which probably wasn't necessarily like an amazingly like good decision from like a business, like standpoint of like cash flow and all that good stuff. But I also at the same time look at that card in particular as like a really good long-term investment in a way. So I'm not really thinking about it in like a micro term. When have you ever shared like your biggest losses? I don't want to like repeat it for the audience if you've done it before, but like, what are you consider like your biggest losses? Not necessarily like from a monetary standpoint, but like cards you feel like you missed out on. You either sold. I shared tune. my biggest L this year, which like I can't remember all of them like off the top of my head, but the biggest L this year has been WWE Prism. Yeah, that was a tough. One. I was surprised by that to be honest, but it kind of was like a. I, I thought... wasn't surprised, but it was because I only bought into it to get out of it within like a two week window. Uh-huh. And Ryan from Burbank, like he was, we were buying it basically at the same time and like text each other back and forth. And, um, you know, it was just one of those ones that again, uh, it, w- I don't know what happened where I was supposed to sell them and it didn't end up happening. And it just, I got caught, but you know, for me, like that stuff, I wouldn't say it's like fun, but it's like fun from the aspect of like, it kind of like makes me like go even like, more like, I don't know, harder in a way like of like flipping and totally. stuff because um, it makes you like, like you need one of those every once in a while because it, it makes you understand that you need to keep continuing to like flip and like, you know, changing inventory from week to week and all that good stuff. Totally. Yeah, I think the WWE one was interesting because I I still think the wrestling audience is like one of the strongest communities there are in, in the hobby, right? Like I think wrestling is extremely strong, extremely loyal. It always has been. Um, I actually did a pod with these guys, Card Foundation Podcast. Shout out to them. Great guys. Uh, like right before WWE, WWE Prism came out. Um, and I thought it was going to be super strong. I thought it was going to be a good product. I think it just got caught in that moment where everything started getting bad really in a hurry. Yeah, um, the, the market, like the economy in general also. It all turned everything. right at that moment. Yeah. So I think yeah. that was a bigger bigger piece of it than anything. And It, it was just weird because it got pumped like, yeah, definitely got pumped like crazy. Well, because it came out at like happens. seven. It got, came out at like 700 and then it went up to like 1400, I think at one point. Yeah, and now it's that. Uh, now, now it's like you can't sell it for like four hundred dollars. <laughs> really? The problem is, yeah. The problem is, is that the cards don't go for anything. Yeah, I mean like, that's uh, just a problem with the wrestling community. Like though. UFC it's Prism just... took a huge shitter too. I mean, like a lot. I would of say these, this. I think I mean, people. Prism... Can... I think there's a lesson to be learned about people chasing bags when it comes to those things and like chasing singles that aren't really there. And the value of singles that aren't this, the value isn't really there. It's more propped up than anything. Um, I think looking back 10 years from now, looking back on right now, I think that'll be one of the things people are talking about where there was just people constantly chasing things, trying to find the next thing. Um, and some had staying power. Some didn't. Uh, yeah, I think it's a big, it'll be a big learning for people coming out of this time. We'll be, the chasing and why that was such a problem. I mean, even F one has come down, like the yeah. wax and the singles, and yeah. Um, I I think twenty twenty still has legs. To be honest, of course, the prices have reset a little bit, as have the prices with pretty much everything. But I definitely think twenty twenty F one has real legs. You can't deny the audience. You can't deny all of those things, as much as people might want to. Um, but yeah, uh, I just I like. FYI, I've sold like all my F1. I think I have like two F1 cards that are under like three or four hundred dollars left. I sold mm-hmm. my wax and all that, but I do like 2020 product because of it being limited in a way from what I feel um, versus the second year product. Um, and I think 
I want to say it's like twenty two or twenty three hundred dollars a box now. Maybe a little 20, bit the, less. The second year product. First year product is like oh, twenty two yeah. or twenty three hundred, which I that came down from wherever it was at in the mid threes or whatever. So yeah, um, that got it got up really high for sure. And again, I think that was another one where people got really excited about it. And as things go in cards, when people get excited about something, the prices shoot up really high, and then they have to reset. Just the way it is. And I think what's happening now is it's shifting people to get into more safer stuff like vintage. Definitely. But at the same time, now that those people are shifting into vintage. That's the new vintage, thing that gets pumped up. That's the new thing that gets pumped up. And what everybody was accustomed to a vintage being safe and you get a, you know, a, a positive maybe ROI from year to year, year slowly, we might be seeing a pretty big rise right in the next maybe couple months or year or so mm -hmm. and then a, a decline from there just because of all the fresh money that at least i'm seeing from the national coming in i bought a man um i bought a mantle 1.5 on off golden just for the reason of bringing it to national yeah because the hype i thought would be there and it, and it sold so that's a tough There's one, though, right? Like the the way that that this tends to move is like you almost have to just completely ignore the waves and just stick to every like stick to what you know. I think that's the only way to do this, and that's kind of what I've tried to do at least in the last year because you know how is expanding. There's more people getting involved. It happens every single day. The cards that move and rise in price, everyone runs to that card and runs to things like that and tries to find the next version of that thing. Um, that's just how it's been for the last two years. For a while, that was okay, and people were still able to make money on whatever they bought. Um, times have changed now, and you can't do that. But there's still people, when they see something and go, uh, everyone runs to it. And I think something someone told me one time, a, a good friend of mine who does wrestling stuff, said to me that when a card sells, a really rare card sells for a lot of money, the reason you see two or three more come out like that is because everyone decided the people who own that card decided that it's too expensive and they're willing to sell it now. And that's kind of something that I've thought a lot about when I, when I see these things rise and it's happening with vintage now, right? Like whatever, uh, uh, you know, using an example of the uh, 86 Fleur Jordan, if that card goes back up again, you're going to, the reason there's so much of that card out is because it's so liquid and the card sells for so much money. So I just think a lot about like the, when you see a rare card sell for a lot of money and then you see two or three more, that means the people who own it decided it's too expensive. And that's a completely flip of a perspective from how you look at it as a buyer. So just something for people to think about. Yeah. And I would say that it's much easier to buy something when everybody else wants it because you think that yes, they're right versus, for example, Trust 86 yourself. clear. Yeah. 86 clear PSA 10s right now. I don't know too many buyers for that mm -hmm. because it's at a hundred and whatever it is, eighty thousand dollars right now. People think the card's going to zero, not zero, but down even more. Like, which it could, but I feel like it is a good play to buy. I In think general, so. I when think other, when other people aren't buying, and that's one of those cards where I feel like a lot of people aren't buying right now, and yeah, I feel like I so many have been ran that realistically how many more need to be put out like like uh people who own the card how many more of, of those people like are willing to sell it or want to sell it i don't know yeah uh, the buyer pool can only be so big for a card like that there's only so many people who a can afford to buy that card and b want to buy it so that's always diminishing returns. And then once you run out of buyers is when the price is the I mean, basic stuff the card has the basic floor and then it goes up again. Cause there's not enough buyers or there's not enough sellers of the car. That's kind of how it moves. That'll happen no matter what the question is when. Yeah. But you and I are different. Like we approach cards very differently. I think, I think I was doing things similar to you for a while and I kind of took a lot of lessons from you to be honest of how to buy and sell but i don't sell cards at the rate that you sell them you know what i mean so we kind of have a different perspective in that way yeah i mean yeah i mean i'm doing this full time and i mean it's just the more volume right I mean, yeah but that's I mean. but yeah. that's why i say like i think a 
like 86 Fleer Jordan 10s, uh, 86 Fleer 10s in general seem like a really interesting thing to me. But you're I like, agree. Oh. Well, no, I agree from the aspect of like an investment. Like the weird thing like with me is like me buying and like I, I can go buy an 86 Fleer like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and use it as inventory. Nine, five, yes, but it's a little bit tougher. And like use it as like inventory for the business and like people want it and there's buyers. Mm -hmm. Like me looking at like a, let's say like a nine, five or 10, that's like a huge investment. So that's just me talking from like a, from like a commentary standpoint of like what I think about the card in a way. Yeah, like it, it, I, I feel like, yeah, I feel like people don't realize like a lot that it's like what I do is like from a standpoint of like I'm like a card shop, but like walking in a way. That's an interesting way to put it. Like I said before, I had never thought about it before, but it makes a lot of sense. There's not a whole big much of a difference between what you do versus like obviously on a different scale between like what you do and what a Burbank does is very similar. Yeah, I mean, again, completely, they they crush it. They're, Their scale is different, different scale. of course, but like in principle. It's but in terms different. of like buying, selling, trading, like yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. We, it's in, yeah. It, hopefully, more people realize that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what are you gonna do? Yeah, um, I think that was a good pod, dude. Listen, anytime I can come on, I would love to be here. You're a very smart kid, Sash. I think people don't give you your flowers. I think you don't get your respect. You deserve more respect. You brought a lot to cards in the last year. You brought a lot of eyes on cards. Um, You're being too nice right now, bro. No, I'm not being too nice. I'm giving. You, I don't give. I don't give you your respect. I'm trying to give you your respect right now, so everyone can hear it. Appreciate you brought that. a lot to cards in the last year and a half, two years, three years, or however long it's been since. How long have we known each other? Like two years now. Probably. Yeah. Probably like two years, right? Yeah, and the time since I've known you, you've brought a lot to the card world, whether that's content wise. Uh, education wise, just your own moves on a daily basis. I think you've opened up a lot of doors for people and people don't respect that either. So um, I just want to make sure you got your respect on this show. I heard <laughs> what you were just saying about the card store, the card shop thing. You want people to respect that more. Sasha's a good dude. I love coming on with Sasha. I love talking to Sasha. Um, I would love to come back on soon too. Yeah. I think we can make it like a, can I know, come on? Can we do me, you and Shia? So I was thinking about that today. I was like, damn, should I tell, like, should I, like, you know, get this going, like me, you, Shia? And I think we should do that in, like, a couple I would of love years. to do it with Shia because I think Shia and I are very similar in a way. Shia has a lot of thoughts. You'd have to get them out of him. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think I can I think I can pull those out of him. Yeah. Shia likes uh, taking jabs, too, at people. Oh, he's so, a like, big jab it, guy, as am I. So I respect that. So he, he it, it, it turns into good content. Yeah. It's all good. Uh, well, one last question before we get off: Do you like? Do you consume uh, card content, like in terms of like other than I know you guys do card talk pod, but like, do you consume it at all? Um, I do because I see it across my social or whatever, and I and I try to listen to podcasts. To be honest, one of my biggest concerns is like. I don't want to start regurgitating someone else's opinion. I want to be able to form mm. my own opinions. And that's kind of a big piece of it for me. Um, I honestly really respect a lot of people in the, in the content game for sure. It's, it's more a function of, I don't want to, I don't want to catch myself saying something that someone else said uh, without giving them credit. Like whenever I try as often as I can, I'm sure I forget people sometimes and all that stuff, but I try to give people love when I do hear something that I think is really smart. Um, but that's the exact reason why. Because if I if I found myself listening to things every single week, I would definitely just start regurgitating stuff, and I don't want to do that. Yeah, and you might not even be thinking that like you are. It's just like right. It just it's subconsciously because I hear things. I also like to listen to podcasts when I sleep, and then I find myself talking about those things. Wait, like you're like full on sleeping and you're listening to it? Like when I go in my room to go to bed, I turn on a podcast to fall asleep. Like some people watch TV, I listen to podcasts. That's what I do. Yeah, like you have your headphones in. No, I just kind of let it rock. Oh, okay, okay yeah. yeah. I mean, like, do you watch TV? Like, do you have a TV in your bedroom? No, but I sometimes. Do you watch TV? Music. What do you do for fun? <laughs> I've asked you this before, um, and I didn't get a clear answer, so I'm asking you again. I like. I like. Uh, I, I like eating like good food. 
say yeah, that's, that's a big one um i play basketball like i like i know you do I'm that. finally yeah. like getting back into shape of playing so that's cool okay um and um like what do you do at home i don't really watch tv like i, I like movies like i like i like right okay movies. so like what's the last movie you watched i watched new dr strange yesterday i enjoyed I, that i like movies but i haven't been able to like I can't so, like, what do you do in your movie. free time? Like, do you have any free time? You have to have free time. You're not like the most busy man in the world. Like, I'm trying. No, to... um, no. I mean, like, look, like, like do you read? this whole last week, we went to a card show. Right, sure. I got back last night. I literally crashed. Woke up this morning. I had to do some, you know, accounting stuff on, in terms of, uh, you know, the business, and mm-hmm. then I had to, uh, you know, log inventory and get all the stuff that was uh, I brought in from national and do that stuff. And then, uh, I had lunch and now I'm on, you know, we're doing this pod. And then Interesting. after this, I got to, uh, actually package some stuff out and then, uh, maybe I'll get a quality bite to eat and go to bed. Bro. It's fascinating. I, yeah, I'm just not built that way. I need like relaxation time, especially I've, I've learned I need relaxation in the morning. So I started waking up and I like just lay there for like 15, 20 minutes and just like let my brain go a little bit. Yeah, I definitely do some of that too. Like, but like I, what about at night? Like at night, like when we're done here, I'm turning off my computer. My day is over. I'm going to eat some dinner and like watch Better Call Saul for two hours and then go to sleep. Yeah, I feel like that's where I'm like, I definitely struggled with like, not struggled, but like taking time to just not do card stuff because then I become better at card stuff. If that makes sure. sense. Sure. Um, so, like, I've definitely over. Like, I this is a fun fact. I started taking melatonin recently. You know that yeah, you told me about that. Definitely helping with like. It's like when do, I go to bed, like you I'm can just, do better I'm, than that. But well, but when I go to bed, like I'm just like I'm. I'm not thinking about anything like else. Yeah, I know it's great. This is like it's amazing. So like, I don't know, like doing a couple of things like that, and like being more focused on like like yourself and like your body and like that those sort of things are things that i want to get better at too mm-hmm. and then taking the time of like um but also at the end of the day bro card stuff is fun for me i get to do like what i want like every single day like yeah that's how i think totally. about it I too like it's I like totally. i can go i like for for a job i get to go to a card show hmm? that's pretty dope right that's super dope but i don't know yeah, i guess so. i've just become like I feel like also, again, we live different lives. Like I've been working full time for the last two years. And I think something I've realized is if I don't give, if I don't force myself to, to shut my brain off and relax, like I will sit at my desk here in my office from, from 9am from 8.30am until like 10.30 at night without even thinking about it. Like I won't eat, I won't do anything. So you'll work till 10.30 like sometimes? If I don't, if I, if I don't force myself to get off, I will absolutely sit here and not get off and I'll like mess around and like I have like ADD so like my brain runs I go do super <laughs> stuff and, like, and I go like, you know, scroll, look at fantasy football for like 20 minutes yeah, and then go yeah. back to work. But like if I don't force myself to get up, I will be here for the next three hours without a question. That's not good. Yeah. So I've like become very aware of like my relaxation time. Maybe it- I think maybe it's because of like COVID of like, it, it's kind of That's like a hundred percent what it is. Yeah. It, it definitely ways. shifted people's mind, not mindsets, but like behavior in a way too. Of like, yeah, 100%. For me, I would never like, like if I would had the opportunity to go and like, maybe go to like a, a nice area, like and whatever it is, like get a good bite to eat. Like I would do that, but now ever since COVID, I'm like I'd rather just order the food and have it at home and 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 chill. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. It's more efficient in my head versus going out, which I think is becoming like sort of a problem for okay. I guess our generation. One thousand percent. It's a massive problem for a lot of people. I think it has an effect on how people talk to each other online, like we talked about earlier. Um, yeah. I there's value in the nothingness of like just going to dinner and like just walking around outside for 15 minutes and just like sitting on your like porch or whatever. Like there's value in that nothingness that I think we took for granted before that everyone needs to find again. That has nothing to do with cards, but that's just something that's been running through my head a lot recently. Yeah. Cause it like feels not like efficient when you do it, but it's actually yeah, like, like fuck efficiency of, to be honest. It's, it's part, like of part of being, being a human. Yeah, it's part of being a human. 
yeah. like of doing those like little things that like make life the fullest. So that, I guess that is like a goal of mine of like doing more like stuff like that to like you should treat yourself, Sash. Yeah. No, like I, I love like I love love doing this. Like, I get to be on a podcast with you and like chill and like do that sort of stuff. Like that's fun. Um but I'm pretty I guess I'm pretty like simple in the way that like I, I don't like too much like going on. I guess. Yeah, you don't like that stuff. You like to keep it mellow. Yeah. But like a fun thing would be like going to New York. Like like fun for me, like like me having fun would be like going to New York and like checking out like the card shop, like seeing like you and like you know, a couple other people yeah. and like that's fun for me. That's yeah, like you got fun. lucky that you get to do something full time. I mean, this is again, we're going off topic, but you got lucky that you found cards and cards is fun for you, so you can go do your everyday life while also doing your work and it's still fun. Yeah. I gotta go to New York. That's, a, that's I'm going to I Boston. I'd love for you to come to New York. I'm going to Boston, then New York. That's what's gonna happen. September New York is an interesting time in New York. Is that like a vibe? It for me it's a vibe because it's kind of like that early fall, still kind of summery, but like you might catch a 60 degree day on like September 14th, and that's lit. Because like fall in New York City is premium, in my opinion. It's my favorite part of the year in New York City. I might do uh might have to do Dallas, Boston, New York, back to back to back. I can get into that. I wonder if the Boston show is around when the Jets are playing the Patriots in, in Foxborough. That would get me up there. I didn't know, but the reason I want to go to Boston is to check out, you know, some of Costa's shops and see what they got going on over there. Because he came over yeah. here. I don't know. If oh, I thought there that. was a Boston show. That's why you said that. Got it. No, I, I just want to. He came over here a couple weeks ago. Did the pod. I took him around. Showed him like all like, yeah. um, you know, the shops and shows. Like on Wednesdays we have three shows. I took him to all three shows. Showed him Frank and Sons, which I don't know if you saw video on, but. Um, it's like a it's like a Costco, except filled with Pokemon, Magic, the Gathering, and sports cards and vendors That's every crazy. Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's insane. That's insane. So like I showed him that, like went to Burbank, and now I want to go up there because I like seeing like different, um, not only like card shops, but like different, like different cities have different vibes for like cards too, and it's just fun for me Definitely. to see. I guess. Definitely. But yeah, let's uh, let's end it there because I don't know how many more people would want to hear about what i like to do for fun <laughs> i think people would but that's for another pod uh i appreciate everybody tuning in guys if you're listening on uh apple Podcasts or spotify make sure you leave a positive review if you're watching on youtube make sure you leave a comment um let us know if you want lujanu back on the card uh or the pod with shia yeah uh, it could be a legendary one and Lou, or if you, you don't so much. if you don't oh, yeah. or if you on. don't let us know like let yeah. us know just say if you hey, thought this was bad let me know so i can get better yeah. <laughs> um, Lou, thank you so much for coming on the pod. I know you're a busy man. Thank you, sir. Taking Sorry. care of uh, Gary V's life. Thank or you. Or part sir. of his life. Part. Of I don't it. know what you. I don't know what you do, but I'll just say that. <laughs> thank you, everybody. I'll, thank you, guys. See you soon.